Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the Scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. If you're using a pew Bible, that's on page 1196. I see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him, Beloved. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we will know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. There were three young fathers who were in the waiting room at a hospital waiting for their children to be born, and suddenly the nurse came out and told the first father that, that uh, his wife had given birth to twins, and he thought, that's incredible. I work for the Minnesota Twins. And then a little bit later, the nurse came out and said to the second father, well, guess what? You've had triplets. And he said, I can't believe it. I work for 3M. At that point, the third man fainted, and when he came to they said, what, are you okay? What happened? He said, well, I'm a, I'm a delivery driver for 7-Up. <laughs> Fathers are unique creatures. And that's one reason why it's fascinating when you journey through Scripture that the identity of God that is most prevalent is that of a father. We just spent the past eight weeks looking at, at, at God as a, as a king, but the title he receives more than any other is that a father? And that's a unique title. Because just by referring to God as Father, I have unintentionally alienated some of you from this lesson. Because for some people, it's hard to embrace the image of God as a father when they've experienced such poor examples of fatherhood in our society and in our own families. Here's why. An estimated 24.7 million children, or or 33%, live absent their biological father here in the United States. Of students in grades 1 through 12, 39% live in homes absent their biological father. Among children who were part of the post-war generation, World War II that is, 87% grew up with two biological parents who were married to each other. Today, only 68% will spend their entire childhood with an intact family. And with the increasing number of premarital births and a continuing high divorce rate, the proportion of children living with just one parent rose from 9% in 1960 to 20% in 2012. Currently, there are 55% of of all African American children, 31% of all Hispanic children, and 20% of all all white children are living in single-parent homes. Since 1960, the percentage of children living only with a mother has risen from 8% to 24.4%. And according to to, uh, 72% of the U.S. population, fatherlessness is the most significant family or social problem facing America. So yes, it can be challenging for some to refer to God as our Father. But I believe it's no accident that we have a father problem in this world because I agree with the author who wrote this. Satan realizes that by pulling fathers from their children, he can twist their understanding of God as a father. 
And, he, and if he can mess up our view of God, then he can harm our desire to connect with God. You see, I believe that children, to some degree, develop a sense of who God is by looking at their relationship with their parents, especially fathers. And so it can be hard for some of us to identify God as our Father. But honestly, it doesn't matter if your father was the greatest father of all time or if your father was the worst father of all time or if you never had a relationship with a father because God is not the reflection of your earthly father. He is the perfection of your earthly father. In other words, if you have a loving father whom you respect, then God is all that and more. If you are disappointed with your father or you didn't have a relationship with him, then God is much more than that. He is greater than that. He is the ideal father. God is everything you could ever want in your earthly father and more. He's the ideal. That's important for us to recognize because it's going to assist us in grasping the first identity I want us to look at in this new series. Because throughout Scripture, we are referred to as children. I am a child, and so are you. But to get to the point of understanding that identity, we have to begin by understanding why God is the ideal Father. What makes God the ideal Father? We're going to focus in on one particular attribute of God to explain this, and that is His love. God is the ideal Father because His love is intentional. His love is intentional. I want you to notice Ephesians chapter 1 with me. Ephesians chapter 1 is this beautiful passage because in it, Paul outlines all of the spiritual blessings that you and I have been blessed with, all that has been given to us. And particularly in verse 3 through 5, Paul speaks about God as a father, or more specifically, us as children. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing and in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. When you really look at that passage, the one thing you have to take away is that God chose you. That's intentional love. You know, we, we often use the term falling in love. We probably have a few teenagers over here who think they're falling in love with somebody. Falling in love, doesn't that sound like an accident? When you really think about that term, I mean, people worry all the time that I'm going to fall off this stage because I walk around it too much, but, but that, that's an accident. Falling in love? Here's the thing, falling in love, it sounds like it was unintentional, it sounds like it just happened out of nowhere, it sounds like it just kind of got you and you weren't expecting it. That's not how God loves you. God's love is no accident. God didn't fall in love with you. God chose to love you before he ever made you. God's love was set upon you, was chosen, was intentional long before you even came into existence. And you know what it, what it means? If God cannot fall in love with you, you know what that means? He can't fall out of love with you either. Because we've been there. We've experienced the whole falling in love thing, and we've also witnessed the falling out of love thing. And if you have one, you by necessity have the possibility of the other, but God can't fall out of love with you because God chose to love you, and that love never goes away. God's love is intentional. And there's no greater metaphor for understanding the intentionality of God's love than adoption, which is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, I'm somewhat familiar with adoption because my, my brother, my older brother, he's three years older than me, he is adopted. At the time, my parents were informed they could not have children, so they went about the adoption process, and three years later, bam, I showed up. And you'll know my brother is adopted if you ever get to meet him because he's six foot two. <laughs> but, but from the time I was born, or as far back as I can remember as a child, I've always known my brother was adopted. But the unique thing about it is there was no difference in the family. As far as the standing of me and my brother as sons, 
as children, as grandsons, as part of the family, we were equals. It didn't matter who his biological parents were. It mattered only who his parents were and who my parents were. We were equals. Adoption is a beautiful metaphor. And adoption appears throughout Scripture as this metaphor for God's love of us. Because the beauty about adoption is you're choosing that individual to be a part of your family. You're choosing to bestow your love upon that child. There's this beautiful story back in the book of first, or excuse me, Second Samuel. It's in chapter 9. And it demonstrates the intentionality of God's love via the man after God's own heart, King David. Back in these ancient times, it was common for a newly installed king to execute all the remaining members of the previous king's household. It was a sign, a demonstration of the end of that particular monarchy and the start of a new one. When David ascended to the throne, he was replacing Saul as king. And you may remember, King Saul hated David. Even attempted to murder David on several occasions, despite David's loyalty to him, despite his friendship with, his, with Jonathan, Saul's son. And Saul and Jonathan both come to their end in battle. David finally receives the throne that he has been promised for so long. But David didn't set about annihilating Saul's family. David took a very, very different approach. He wanted to show mercy to the household of Saul. And he asked his court if there was anyone in the lineage of Saul that was still alive on whom he could show kindness. And he was informed that there was a son of Jonathan who was a grandson of Saul, and his name was, was Mephibosheth. So David called, summoned for Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth feared for his life as he approached the palace. And the reason Mephibosheth feared for his life is he knew the standard practice of the day. You execute anybody who's a, of the lineage of the previous king. But more than that, Mephibosheth was also worried because Mephibosheth was crippled. He couldn't walk. So what that means is he couldn't even throw himself at the feet of David for mercy and beg just to be a hireling that goes out in the fields and works for David. He couldn't even offer himself as a resource to David because there's nothing he could provide David. So Mephibosheth is approaching the throne of David, fearful for his life, fully expecting that he would be executed because he was an offspring of the former king who could, no, could not serve the current king. As he approached the throne of King David, imagine his surprise when he heard David say, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Instead of executing Mephibosheth, David restored to him all of his family's land and invited him continually to eat at his table. In a sense, Mephibosheth became the adopted son of David because Jonathan, Mephibosheth's father, was no longer alive. David treated Mephibosheth, someone who in that culture should have been accounted as an enemy, David treated as family. He chose to show his love to him. In the same manner, God cho chooses to show his love to us. Because guess what? Each one of us is a Mephibosheth. I want you to go to Romans uh, uh, chapter 5 with me. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 4 with me. Because each of us at some point in time needed to be adopted by God. And it's Galatians chapter 4, and verses 4 through 7, that we read these words. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under law, the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Mephibosheth thought his only hope would be to be able to be enslaved to David. Knowing his physical state, he knew that was an impossibility. But David didn't bring Mephibosheth to the court to make him a slave. He came to bring him to make him a son. And that's exactly what God did for us through his own son, redeeming us so that we could be his children. We deserve execution for our sins. But instead, we receive adoption. 
into the family of God because God chose to love us. Not only is God's love intentional, but God's love is also unconditional. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39, we have this description of all the things that cannot separate us from God's love. It's fairly all-encompassing. Verse 38 says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, there's nothing that can keep God from loving you. There's another great story in the Old Testament that demonstrates this. It's kind of a challenging story. It's from the book of Hosea. And if you're familiar with the prophet Hosea, you understand that Hosea's prophetic work was largely wrapped up in his actual life. It's in Hosea chapter 1 that God speaks to Hosea and essentially tells Hosea, instructs Hosea to marry an adulterous woman because God is going to use their relationship to serve as a living metaphor of his relationship with mankind. So Hosea does what God says. He marries an adulterous woman, and sure enough, she abandoned the marriage and the family and returned to a life of prostitution. But here's where the story really gets challenging and really demonstrates to us God's love. Because it's under these circumstances that God instructed Hosea to go find his unfaithful wife, and as Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1 tells us, to go love her again. Go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin. Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1. God's saying, this is how it feels to be me. But I want you to do what I do. Go love her again. In order to reconcile the relationship, Hosea had to redeem her from slavery. He literally had to buy his wife. According to his own words, he says, So, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lithic of barley. He had to purchase his wife back. And then after paying to get his wife back, Hosea essentially renews their vows. If you're looking in Hosea chapter 3 and verse 3, look at what he says. He says, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. He's telling her, you have to be faithful to me. But the vows were not one-sided. Because as soon as he finished saying that to her, he concluded with his own commitment to faithfulness and said, so will I also be to you. Hosea had, had never failed the relationship. Hosea had never left her, abandoned her, cheated on her. But what he's saying is, I am renewing my vows to you again because I've got to love you again. And what God demonstrates through the story of Hosea is that he never stops loving us and he never stops seeking to redeem us and he never stops being faithful to us as Hosea was to Gomer his wife. And that's us. We're a bunch of gomers. Quite literally, a bunch of gomers because we go around unfaithful to God at times. At some point in our life, we've been unfaithful to Him because we ventured into the realm of sin and we've broken the relationship. And as a result, God has to redeem us. And I want you to notice the language of Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, as it talks about God's love and God's redemption. It says that God, it says that God showed His love to us. While we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were enemies, and it's through His Son's death that we're reconciled to God from those states of weakness, of sin, of enemy status. In other words, when we were at our worst, God still loved us. 
So just like Gomer, we deserve divorce. But instead, we are accepted back into the marriage because God never stops loving us. His love is unconditional. God is the ideal father because he loves us intentionally, because he loves us unconditionally. And so that should have an impact on us. The fact that he's that kind of father, it should change the way we view ourselves. Because we are identified as his children. And how should our identity as children impact the way we live? First, children are expected to resemble their father. You've never seen me without a beard. I started growing the beard the very next year. That's also the same year I stopped growing tall. (laughs) Now, children are expected to resemble their father. One of the amazing things is anytime a child is born, the first thing people do is they start looking at this child, this undeveloped face, and start trying to say, oh, you've got the nose of your father, or oh, you've got the mouth of your mother. And we start picking out those traits that look like one of the parents. And I remember when Micah was born, I was sitting there looking at her and said, no, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see me. I couldn't see Sarah. I could just see this beautiful princess. But as she's aged, she just hid, by the way. I just saw her go down and hide. As she aged, not only did some physical traits, there's some characteristics between me and her. We're about the same age in these two pictures. Don't you love my bowl cut, by the way? I started noticing physical traits that look like me and physical traits that look like Sarah and also characteristics. Just yesterday, we went to the mall with uh, Jeremy and the girls. uh, Well, actually, two Jeremys and their girls. Jeremy Beach and Jeremy Payton, there, and there goes, we all went to the mall. We ended up at the Disney store because they were doing this special thing uh, where, where this thing related to, uh, they did a parade at the end, and the, and the girls could put on masks of uh, different princesses, and they could march through the, the store as part of a Disney parade. And all those girls did it, but mine crawled up in my arms because she's just like her daddy. When there's too many people looking, she gets really, really shy. You know, you start to recognize those traits in your kids. They resemble you to some degree. Do you realize that God is the Father and we are His children? There is an expectation that we're going to resemble Him in some capacity, right? I want you to notice some passages in Scripture in regard to this. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul says, be imitators, be imitators of God as beloved children. And journey throughout the New Testament, and you can see things like this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, it calls on us to be holy as He is holy. And then there is uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says that we should forgive as Christ forgave us. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 says that we should accept others as Christ accepted you. Luke chapter 6 and verse 36 36 says that we should be merciful as your Father is merciful. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 tells us to walk in love as Christ loved us. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, walk in the light as He is in the light. In 1 John chapter 3 verses 2 through 3 instructs us to be pure as He is pure. If you journey throughout the New Testament, one thing you're going to find out is there's this expectation that we're going to resemble our Father. Jesus himself even said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is this pursuit of resemblance that we're to be moving in the direction of. And when we embrace our identity as children of God, we're going to seek to imitate his characteristics in such a way that we'll be recognized as one of his. I'm reminded of 1 John chapter 3, where it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. And the same chapter goes on to call on us to abandon the pursuit of, of sin. 
Picking up in verse 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So let me ask you, is it evident that you're a child of God because you resemble him? Can somebody look at you and see your pursuit of righteousness and go, yep, that's a child of God. I recognize him. He looks just like his father. Because if not, then something probably needs to change. There's something that needs to change so that it's evident that you belong to the Father. Because there is this expectation in Scripture that we look like Him. But not only do children, not only are children expected to resemble their father, they're also expected to trust their father. I told you before about how Micah likes to jump off things into my arms. Children love to do that. Children love to, to jump into your arms, and they do it because they know you're going to catch them. You see the picture on the screen of this father tossing his child up in the air. There are a great many of you who cringe when they see daddies do this. Hate to see daddies toss their kids up in the air because you have this fear that they're going to drop them. But you know what is happening when a father is tossing his child up in the air? He's teaching that child to trust him. I remember doing that with Micah. Throwing her up in there. Actually, I still do when I can. Sometimes I need a little help, though. Tossing your child in the air. And Micah knows that if I toss her in the air, I'm going to catch her. And so she's learned when she climbs up on the playground and she has me standing below that she can just jump off because I'm going to catch her. And when she's coming down the stairs and she's still got about three to go, she can jump off because she knows I'm going to catch her. Or when she's standing on the bed and it's time to get down, instead of climbing, she knows she can jump off because I'm going to catch her. She's learned to trust that about me. And here's my question. When did we as adults stop being someone's child? Because we are God's children. And here's the thing about us as adults. As we age, we start getting worried about jumping. We, we tighten up a little bit. We, we start wanting to, 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 to uh, get the information together before we take a jump. We want to calculate the distance, the free fall. We, we want to know how we're going to be stopped. When we, as we mature, for some reason, we get more hesitant and we need more information. And it's not so much that we're trusting anymore, it's more we need the evidence that we will be safe when we jump. It's the same reason when we get on an airplane, many people have fear of flying because in the airplane, they don't know what to do if something happens to the pilot. They won't tell you that's the reason, but that's what it boils down to because when you're on an airplane, you have absolute zero control unless you know how to fly an airplane. The funny thing is, you think behind the wheel of a car you have control? You don't have control over the other people on the road. You have the, the idea, the perception that you're in control in a car because you have a steering wheel. You know, the same perception we give the kids when we go to Kroger and they're in the buggy with the steering wheel, the same perception. That's you in a car. But because we have the perception of control, we feel more comfortable. We trust quite less than we did when we were children. And yet God expects us to trust Him. I mean, look at some of the stories in Scripture. God often asks His children to do the seemingly impossible things. He asked Noah to build an enormous boat, fill it with thousands of animals, even though it didn't make sense to build a seaworthy vessel because there was no rain in sight. He asked Abraham to execute his only son, even though it didn't make sense to kill the heir through whom God was supposed to make him into a great nation. He asked Gideon to reduce his military from 10,000 to 3,000 men and go into battle equipped with torches and trumpets, even though the other military was quite a bit bigger and had better weapons. God has asked his children to do the seemingly impossible, and each time 
He was wanting to show them that they could trust him. Because God expects us to trust. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, John wrote, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Not once did that verse mention trust, but what the verse is really saying is that, we, that is John is instructing us to not be afraid of anyone or anything, but to trust in the one who will always catch us. When we embrace our identity as children, we surrender control of our, our lives to him. We, we accept what Proverbs chapter 3 says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge Him. He will make straight your paths. Because God wants us to be like the child who's not afraid to jump. Where do you need to jump? Where do you need to let go and let God be in control? Is it your health, or your finances, or your family, or your fears, or your grief, or your future, or your stresses? What is it that you need to let go of so that God can be in control? Because when we embrace our identity as children, we recognize trust. And finally, children are also expected to obey their father. Now this one doesn't always work so well, does it? I want you to think, though, when it comes to the factor of obedience, how many decisions do you leave up to your children? Do you let them choose where the family will live? Do you let them choose what career you will have? Do you let them choose how you're going to invest your money for retirement? Do you let them choose whether or not they're going to go to school? Do you let them choose whether or not they're going to go to a worship service? See, we have greater expectations of our children on factors such as coming to worship than we do of ourselves sometimes. Because there are some decisions we're not leaving up to our kids. We expect them to fall in line with the decisions that we make as adults. See, obedience is more than doing the right things. Obedience comes from a pure heart, motivated by a pure heart that seeks to obey out of love. There's a parable in Matthew chapter 21 called the parable of the two sons. And according to the parable, a man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and he went. And then the father went to the other son and said to the same, and, and the other son answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. And Jesus asked, Which of the two did the will of his father? He said, The first. The one who didn't give the correct response but had the right motivation in the end. See, the obedience flowed out of his heart to do what his father desired. The determining factor wasn't the response. The determining factor was the motivation of the heart, the love for the father. And when we embrace our identity as children of God, our identity, or excuse me, our desire is to obey him because we love him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1-4 through 4 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. See, God's commands aren't burdensome when you love Him. If you find it too difficult to be a child of God, if you find it too difficult to obey, then what you need to look at is not the rules, but you need to look at your own heart because you might have a love issue with God. Because when you love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, it's not a problem to do anything He ever asks of you. Because you're not motivated by being right. You're motivated out of love. So what's your motivation of obedience? Or maybe a better question is, which of the two sons are you? The one who initially said no but ended up going? Or the one who initially said yes 
and never went. You see, there's something beautiful about the identity of a child, about the fact that God is Father and we are His children. And I'm reminded of this story that's told of a king who was in his throne room. And he was holding counsel with his advisors, his noblemen, the, the ministers of state. And suddenly there was a bang and a clatter at the door of the throne room. And all eyes turned to the door and burst through it was a young boy who ran into the room. And one of the king's guards tried to stop the boy. He said, hold on there, lad. You, don't you know you're disturbing the counsel of the king? And the boy laughed at him. He said, he's your king, but he's my daddy. I'm reminded of that video that has gone viral this week of the father on a BBC uh, newscast and his children burst in the room. I love the stiff arm he put on the one. Those kids just wanted to be where their dad was. And it wasn't a good time for the dad. But the beautiful thing is we have a father. We have a father who is always ready for us to run to his arms. The father depicted in the prodigal son. But you know, there's only one way to be a child of God. Only one way to receive that title. And it's by putting on Christ in baptism. As Galatians chapter 3 says at the end of the chapter, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and if you are Christ, it says in the last verse, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Don't you want to be a child today? It's in Matthew 18, 3 that Jesus says, unless you become like one of these children, you cannot inherit the kingdom. Why don't we all inherit the kingdom today? Why don't we all adopt the identity of children? And if there's anything you need to do to correct your identity so that it is that of a child, won't you do so while together we stand and sing? In Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often hold.